Welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to talk about LTGA or level transposition of the great vessels, also known as congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries. Okay, so we've previously talked about dextro TGA, which is a far more common and classical condition. In G transposition of the great arteries, we had each of the great vessels living from the wrong ventricles. That is, we had the pulmonary trunk living from the left ventricle and the aorta living from the right ventricle, a phenomenon called arteriovenricular discordance. They are mismatched. In level TGA, we are also going to have ventricular arterial discordance. The great difference here and the reason we have dextro and level is because in LTJ, what had its place switched were not the great vessels, but rather the ventricles. So we actually have the aorta draining the left heart and the pulmonary trunk draining the right heart. Except that we will have the aorta draining the right ventricle because the right ventricle is in the left heart and we will have the pulmonary trunk draining the left ventricle because the left ventricle is in the right heart. So, transposition of the great vessels is characterized by ventricular arterial discordance. However, in dextro TJ, we have the great vessels switched, whereas in LTJ, we have the ventricles switched. Personally, I think it would be maybe easier to just call it transposition of the heart ventricles. However, I'm not a cardiac surgeon, so I'm going to defer to the judgment of those who named it. And you can just remember that in both cases, you have the great vessels and their ventricles mismatched. They are not what they should be. The same will extend to the valves. You have the mitral valve on the right heart between the right atrium and the left ventricle and the tricuspid valve in the left heart between the left atrium and the right ventricle. Notwithstanding they are both presentations of ventricular arterial discordance, the consequences are going to be pretty different. In GTJ, we had the formation of two closed loop systems which would be incompatible with life unless we had some sort of communication between the right and left hearts, such as atrial and ventricular septal defects or a pit inductus arteriosus, preferably multiple and very large. In LTJ, we are not going to have that. We don't have the formation of two closed loop systems because, after all, the blood that's coming into the left heart is going to leave through the aorta and the blood that's going to come into the right heart is going to leave towards the lungs through the pulmonary trunk. So that's not our problem here. Which could bring the question, so what's exactly the problem? Because after all, that's why it's called congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries. Because even with the mismatch between heart chambers and vessels, we still have working operational, systemic and pulmonary circulations. Put bluntly, there is a reason we have a right side of the heart and a left side of the heart and not just a completely symmetrical heart. The main cause being that the left heart deals with much higher pressures since it's pushing against the systemic circulation. That's why the left ventricle is much stronger and with more muscular mass than the right one. In the same way, the tricuspid valve, which is in the right heart normally, wasn't designed to deal with the very high pressures found in the left ventricle. The mitral valve is better suited for that. Therefore, in CCTGA, the greatest problem is that the right ventricle and the tricuspid valve 
have been placed in a situation to which pressure they were not suited for. The left ventricle on the right side of the heart now, and the mitral valve will be pretty comfortable working against the pulmonary circulation pressure, a lower resistance than they are used to. However, the right ventricle is now on the left side of the heart and pushing against the systemic vasculature, trying to force blood into the aorta. Since it wasn't designed for this heavy load, it may experience right ventricular failure. And at the same time, as it tries to reach the pressures required to force blood into the aorta, the tricuspid valve will be put under tremendous strain to try to prevent backflow from the right ventricle to the left atrium, which is likely to lead to tricuspid valve regurgitation, or, if you prefer, systemic tricuspid valve regurgitation, considering that here the tricuspid valve is actually placed on the left side of the heart. And finally, since your ventricles are switched because your heart looped for the wrong side when forming, you can imagine that this left-handed loop hasn't done any wonders for the communication between atria and ventricles. So, along with the atrioventricular discordance, you are most likely to have a somewhat malformed atrioventricular node, which is why cardiac arrhythmias are pretty common. There is a 2% chance of heart block each year, and complete heart block requiring a pacemaker is actually quite common. As a general rule, because of these anatomical alterations to the AV node, pretty much all patients will be somewhat bradycardic. And there we have it. Anatomically speaking, in LTGA or CCTGA, we have both the ventricular arterial discordance, which we also find in GTGA, and additionally, the atrioventricular discordance, also known the combination as double discordance, which causes blood entering the heart from the superior and inferior vena cava to the right atrium to flow through the mitral valve into the left ventricle before being pumped into the pulmonary trunk, going through the lungs and returning to the pulmonary veins to the left atrium, then being pumped through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, which will at last force the blood into the aorta, which may lead long term to the three major complications, right ventricular failure, tricuspid regurgitation, and complete heart block. Contrary to dextro-TGA, levo-TGA is not a cyanotic heart disease. There is nowhere for mixing to occur or any way for deoxygenated blood to enter the systemic circulation. That is, of course, unless it's associated with other heart defects, such as a ventricular septal defect, which is actually common, but by itself, it does not cause cyanosis. Therefore, the initial presentation may actually be the complications. In the late childhood or even adult life, once heart block develops or the patient begins to present symptoms of heart failure. Although it's not uncommon for patients to be diagnosed incidentally when performing an EKG on a routine consultation, for example, or even for a prenatal diagnosis to occur on Doppler echocardiograph of the fetus, those who are not incidentally diagnosed through imaging studies are likely to present in late childhood or early adulthood with classical symptoms of heart block or cardiac failure, such as fainting or dyspnea, for example. This will eventually then elicit a echocardiography, which is going to confirm the diagnosis. Other imaging studies such as cardiac MRI are useful. However, transesophageal echocardiography is usually the preferred method. For obvious reason, an electrocardiography is also important 
to detect abnormalities in the conduction system of the heart. On imaging studies, what draws attention is the presence of parallel great vessels. The great vessels, the pulmonary trunk, and the aorta should cross. Non-crossing great vessels, great vessels that arise from the heart, in parallel indicate ventricular arterial discordance. Since we already know the complications, we can deduce the treatment. Severe tricuspid valve regurgitation is going to be treated surgically with tricuspid valve replacement. Complete heart blocks will be treated through a pacemaker installation. And associated defects, such as a ventricular septal defect, may be also closed surgically early on. Unfortunately, the standard therapy for heart failure, including diuretics, digitalics, and beta blockers, has shown very little effect on reducing mortality on cases of systemic right ventricular failure, that is, failure of the right ventricle that is on the left side pumping against the systemic circulation, which is what we have in LTGA. While the standard drugs may provide symptomatic relief, unfortunately, heart transplantation is the only unequivocal treatment for heart failure in level TGA. Indeed, there exists a surgical procedure aimed at providing an anatomical repair to the heart, that is, restoring the chambers to the correct blood flow order, albeit since it's a quite complex and large procedure, and AOTJ is not a cyanotic heart disease, which may go asymptomatic for many decades, there is a strong argument for reserving this double switch procedure only to the most severe cases and allowing other patients to be managed only with palliative surgeries. The decision will vary based on the team's expertise with the procedure, and the patient's severity. In any case, the double switch procedure consists in switching the drainage of both atria, an atrial inversion, and then also switching the great vessels. This way, blood arriving from the vena cava will drain to the left atrium, then through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle and then be pumped through the pulmonary trunk to the lungs to come back into the right atrium and then be pumped through the mitral valve into the left ventricle before being pumped into the aorta. This may seem unnecessarily complex, but remember that what really matters here are not the atria, but rather the ventricle since what we want the most is to leave the stronger ventricle with the heavier load, that is, the left ventricle should be pumping into the aorta. The disease etiology is poorly understood. There is a suspicion that it's multifactorial and that, like other congenital heart diseases, it may have an association with the deletion of the chromosome band 22Q11. However, it's also possible it could be associated with heterotaxy, a disease where internal organs are not arranged correctly, and thus be associated with laterality gene defects. The disease is considered rare, accounting for about half a percent of all congenital heart defects. And finally, somewhat intuitive but hard to visualize, the pathophysiology of this entire mechanism is that when the heart tube is developing, it's supposed to loop around itself to the right, and then the aortic pulmonary septum is supposed to rotate 180 degrees. If only the aortic pulmonary septum fails to rotate, but the looping occurs correctly to the right, then we get dextro transposition of the great arteries. That is, we get only ventricular arterial discordance. If during its development the heart loops to the left instead of looping to the right, but then the aortic pulmonary septum rotated precisely its correct 180 degrees, we would get a heart 
with atrioventricular discordance, but not with ventricular arterial discordance, which leads us to believe that the left-handed looping of the heart tube results in atrioventricular discordance and the failure of the aortic pulmonary reception to rotate 180 degrees leads to ventricular arterial discordance. Therefore, if both of them happen during embryology, if the heart loops to the left and the aortic pulmonary septum fails to rotate, we get a heart that has both atrioventricular and ventricular arterial discordance that has mixed discordance. That is, we get a heart with level transposition of the great arteries. Thank you for watching my video and for choosing to spend your time with me. Please bear in mind that this video is meant only as a medical review and should not be taken as medical advice if you believe you or someone you know may have CCTGA. Please seek your physician. If you believe one of our patients may have LTGA, please check the latest protocols. Thank you once again for watching my video. If you are interested in congenital heart diseases, make sure to check my playlist on it. As well as, if you are interested in general medical topics, check my other videos on different themes. I hope this explanation has been useful, and I hope to see you on my next video.